So a very warm welcome to the afternoon session entitled Economy, Society and the Well-Being of Citizens. Given the drama of recent events, uh, including our recent economic crisis and the austerity period that followed, uh, and this year with Brexit, and most recently the dramatic result in the American elections, it is timely to reflect on Ireland's economic and societal performance over a much longer time frame and also our prospects for the future. As a small and relatively young country, it is not surprising that we are very interested in comparing our performance uh, with that of other countries. In terms of economic and social performance, this session will discuss and debate what we have done well uh, and also what we've done less well. A key question will be how different that performance has really been uh, compared to our peers, notwithstanding the eventfulness uh, of the last 100 years. To set the scene for this discussion, uh, we are extremely fortunate to have one of the world's leading economic historians, Professor Kevin O'Rourke, as our plenary speaker with a paper entitled Independent Ireland in Comparative Perspective. We also have a distinguished panel of respondents with representation from many of Ireland's leading research and higher education institutions. They will extend Kevin's theme with more detailed discussions of areas such as equality of opportunity and outcomes for children, our reservoirs of civic capital, the challenges facing indigenous industry, the successes and failures of our industrial strategy, and the challenges of urbanization. So to our plenary uh, speaker, Kevin O'Rourke is the Chichelle Professor of Economic History at the University of Oxford and Fellow of All Souls College. He was previously Professor of Economics at Trinity College Dublin, a lecturer and senior lecturer at uh, University College Dublin, where he's currently visiting professor, and also an assistant professor at uh, Cl Cl Columbia University, New York. Kevin received his PhD in economics from Harvard in 1989 and his undergraduate degree from Trinity. And Kevin had actually just finished up his uh, graduate studies the year before I started mine. Uh, and I heard about this incredibly talented uh, Irish economist who is applying theories uh, of uh, new theories of economic growth and international trade uh, to economic history. And he's clearly gone on to have a truly outstanding career. He's also a member of the Royal Irish Academy and a fellow of the British Academy. Kevin has worked extensive, extensively on the history of uh, the international economy, and among his publications are the award-winning Globalization and History, his magisterial uh, Power and Plenty, Trade, War, and the World Economy in the Second Millennium, and also the two-volume Cambridge Economic History uh, of Modern Europe. Just to give you a sense of the uh, structure, uh, Kevin will present for at most 50 minutes, uh, and then each respondent will have at most eight minutes, and it will be uh, pretty tough on the time to make sure then that we have a uh, good time uh, for uh, Q&A at the end. And I will introduce uh, the uh, respondents uh, just before each of them speaks. So, Kevin, thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, John. A hutron a halskalia a chahirli a neusla is more on an hour than the partak in Sundisbarak Tavak Trasha a galskal neheran galiv. It really is a very great honour to be here today, so thank you very much. Who's going to work? Which way do I go? Whoops. Okay, now. Okay, now I have it. Good. Somebody clever, I'm not exactly sure who, is supposed to once have said that he who only tries to understand Ireland will not even understand Ireland. When I was a young boy in primary school, we were taught that post-independence Ireland was poor, but uniquely virtuous. Today, we're more likely to be taught that it was poor and uniquely wicked. Both positions are misguided. You can find both Mehel and Magdalen laundries in other countries if you're minded to go out and try to find them. The past is a foreign country everywhere. And what's true of Irish social history is even truer in Irish, of Irish economic history. 
Very often what was happening here at a particular time was in fact part of a bigger European or even global process. Now, I used to think that this quotation was due to Nicholas Canny, and that would have made sense given his career, but he denies it. On the other hand, I am pretty clear in my mind that it was Rudyard Kipling who once said or asked, what do they know of England who only England know? And so it seems as though not even a certain tendency to occasionally gaze at our navels is unique to Ireland. It's a normal human thing to do. We're not even unusual in that regard. And so my primary purpose in this talk is to try to place Irish post-independence post economic history into some sort of comparative context and to try to convince you that in fact our economic history is in many respects not particularly unusual. Now it's true of course that the circumstances of our state's birth were dramatic. Maybe not that unusual, as we heard last night, in the context of the time, but they were dramatic, and there was a moment where we really did hold the world's attention. Uh, but then we settled down to become what we'd chosen to become, a poor, uh, reassuringly boring and stable uh, peripheral economy on the outskirts of Europe, and we gradually faded away from the, you know, the, the attention of the rest of the world. I'm going to argue that our subsequent economic history is just about exactly what you would have predicted if you'd known in 1922 the turn that European history was about to take. Our economic policies weren't particularly unusual, and over the long run our economic performance was just about exactly what you would have predicted as well. But of course this conference is also taking place under the shadow of Brexit, and the question which thus arises is, Will Boris and his merry band of Brexiteers succeed in completing the task begun by Patrick Pearce and his colleagues in 1916? Will they complete the economic and political separation between our island and Great Britain? Will their efforts lead to Ireland becoming more fully independent of Britain than it's been to date, and perhaps uncomfortably so? Will we have to stand more squarely on our own two feet than we might perhaps wish? And so a second major theme in my talk will be the changing nature of Ireland's economic relationships over the course of the last century with both Britain and continental Europe. If there was one way in which our post-independence economic history was indeed unusual for many decades, and unhelpfully so, it was our excessive dependence on a poorly performing British economy. Membership of the EEC in 1973 and the European Single Market Programme of the late 80s and early 90s were absolutely crucial in transforming Irish fortunes. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense to discuss Irish post-independence economic performance without spending at least some time on the colonial backstory. Irish economic performance under British rule was disappointing and occasionally tragic. The famine of the 1840s was genuinely unusual. I need to acknowledge that since I'm claiming that we're not all that unusual. That was a genuinely remarkable event, the last mass subsistence crisis in peacetime Western Europe, with the exception, of course, of the Finnish famine of the 1860s. Uh, as you can see here, it ushered in a wave of mass emigration, which led to a population decline that persisted in the 26 counties up until 1961. And that is genuinely weird in the context of a Europe of the late 19th century, which was uh, experiencing a population explosion. So this is really unusual. And yet even here, however, you have to be careful not to overdo the point. I've plotted here emigration rates, decadal emigration rates per thousand of the population in Ireland, Italy, Norway, and Sweden. As you can see, by the end of this period, Italy was experiencing emigration rates well in excess of our own, and Norway was also exporting large numbers of its people. Furthermore, uh, economic historians have shown that it was the same underlying forces that were driving emigration throughout Western Europe at this time. Emigration rates were systematically higher in countries with higher fertility rates, in countries that were poorer, and in countries with a previous history of emigration. Well, Ireland's marital fertility rates were still high during this period. We were still a very poor country, and the famine had deposited about a million Irish people overseas, and in particular in North America. High emigration rates are precisely what you would have expected in the circumstances. You don't need to appeal to any supposed peculiarities of the Irish psyche in, a, in order to explain why so many of us left during this period. Now, this backstory had three important consequences for the 20th century that I want to highlight. First, 
since a history of previous emigration leads to a higher tendency to emigrate in the future, Irish people remained extremely mobile after independence, uh, which was both good and bad for the economy in ways that generations of economists, political scientists, policymakers have debated. One consequence was that by making workers scarcer in Ireland, it increased their price. You lower the supply of labor domestically, wages are going to increase. That's what you can see here. You can see that by the end of the 19th century, unskilled building laborers' wages in Dublin were just about at the same level as in London. And this wasn't because we'd had a remarkable growth spurt towards the end of this period. This was because the Irish and British labor markets were very closely linked together, and so Irish workers basically got to earn British wages. Is this unusual? No. Something very similar happened in both Norway and Italy. Now, this was both good and bad. There's a reason why God gave economists two hands. On the one hand, it helped sustain living standards that wouldn't otherwise have been attainable, and that was, of course, good. But on the other hand, it also meant that the Irish economy was deprived, at least to some extent, of one of the main advantages which poor countries generally possess, namely cheap labor. On the eve of World War I, Ireland was still pretty poor, but it was clearly much richer than it had been in 1870, let alone 1840. But growth in per capita living standards that was largely due to a decline in the num number of capitas to a falling population was hardly anything to shout about. Southern Irish prosperity in 1913, such as it was, was based on very different foundations than prosperity elsewhere. The key to economic growth during the late 19th century in general was industrialization. And the key to industrialization in Germany, in Italy, France, the US, and elsewhere was, in fact, protectionism. Now, during the late 20th and early 21st centuries, globalization and growth have gone hand in hand. But what, was true to, you know, what is true now wasn't necessarily always true. Um, as you can see here, there's a very strong positive correlation in the data between tariffs protecting industry in particular and economic growth. And to the economists, I should say that this simple bivariate correlation holds up when you can do it properly and econometrically and control for country fixed effects and time fixed effects and other variables that can uh, influence growth and so on. Well, of course, as a region of the free trading UK, an independent tariff policy was unavailable to Ireland. These data suggest that Irish nationalists weren't completely crazy in the context of the time in believing that this was, in fact, a serious handicap. And so a second legacy of the 19th century, which became important in the 20th, was an ideological commitment to protectionism among a certain stratum of Irish nationalist thinkers. Once again, there was nothing unusual about this. It was rather the UK, with its strong commitment to more or less unilateral free trade, even as its protectionist rivals gained market share at its expense, which was the exception during this period. But this intellectual commitment to protectionism would eventually run up against a third legacy of Irish history, which was the extent to which the Irish and British economies were intertwined. The south of Ireland was overwhelmingly specialized in agricultural activities. Its agricultural exports went overwhelmingly to the UK. As we've seen, the Irish and British labor markets were very tightly integrated with each other. The Irish Free State, and later the Republic, shared a common legal system with Britain, a common currency, and many other institutions. For much of the 20th century, it makes a lot of sense to regard Ireland, even independent Ireland, as being just one small regional component of a broader British plus Irish economy. And the problem was that this broader British plus Irish economy, within which the British component was obviously overwhelmingly dominant, was a poor performer within the broader European context. Now, on to independent Ireland. In order to assess Irish performance, we need a benchmark. Because of our history, a natural tendency is to use the UK, but that's a mistake. Uh, the UK performed poorly relative to most European economies. By using it as a benchmark, we're setting the bar much too low. A second alternative is to compare ourselves with similarly placed regions inside the UK, Northern Ireland most obviously, but perhaps also Scotland or Wales. As you'll see, doing this provides us with several useful insights, but again, by comparing ourselves with regions inside a poorly performing UK economy, we're again setting the bar much too low. A third alternative, which makes a lot more sense, is to compare ourselves with other relatively poor economies around the European periphery. Greece, Portugal, Spain were all as poor as Ireland at the start of the 20th century, if not poorer. 
They therefore faced many of the same obstacles that we did, but they also shared the same potential for rapid growth based on catching up on the industrial core. How did we do compared with these economies? Indeed, how well did we do compared with European economies more generally? Now, let's see if this clicker works. Is this going to work? No, I, I'll probably blind the panel if I try to play with the laser too much, so I, I better, I'll just ask you to look at this then. It's a matter of statistical fact that within Europe, during the 20th century, countries that were initially poorer have grown more rapidly than countries that were initially richer. In other words, poorer countries have tended to converge on richer ones, mostly as a result of importing best practice technologies already adopted overseas. Now, we don't have reliable national income evidence for Ireland before 1926, despite what you may read in some places. So what I've done here is I've plotted initial income levels per capita, that's on the horizontal axis, in 1926, against growth rates over the subsequent three quarters of a century on the vertical uh, axis. So the further you move to the left, the poorer you are in 1926, and the further up the axis, you, the, the vertical axis you move, the higher was the growth rate between 26 and 2001. I've done this for the broadest available sample of European countries for which we have data. I've excluded countries that later became communist because their histories are obviously not comparable at all. And I've included the USA there just for a bit of a perspective as well. And what you can see is that there's a remarkably clear statistical relationship between these two variables. I didn't have to cheat to make the data look this way. This is just what they look like. Initially, poor countries like Portugal have grown much, much more rapidly over the course of the 20th century than initially rich countries like Switzerland. The line there, the blue line, what economists call the regression line, gives the average statistical relationship in the data between these two variables. And as you can see from the scatter plot, the statistical fit of this relationship is remarkably tight in that countries are very closely clustered around this line. So convergence is a feature of the data in the 20th century in Western Europe, and that gives us a reasonable benchmark against which to measure Irish performance. And as you can see, over this 75-year period, Ireland did exactly as well as it should have done, given our initial position. We were not at all unusual. We were completely average over the period as a whole. Now, that's over the period as a whole. But of course, that leaves open the possibility that in some periods, we might have done better than in others. So now I'm going to do the standard thing. I'm going to divide up history into the periods from 22 to 50, from 50 to 73, and then from 73 onwards. So let's start with, first of all, the interwar period. If there's one thing that's unusual about Irish economic policy making after independence, it's that it took so long for the Irish Free State to move in a protectionist direction. We were remarkably liberal for a remarkably long time. For example, the successor states of the Austria-Hungarian Empire almost immediately implemented a very wide range of protectionist measures. By contrast, we stuck with free trade just about as long as any state could reasonably have been expected to do so. Now, as we all know, the election of Fianna Fáil in 1932 coincided with a dramatic shift towards protection. But there are three questions about this policy shift that I think we can usefully ask. First, are its causes really to be found in Irish party politics alone? Second, was Ireland unusually protectionist? And third, was Irish protectionism unusually costly? My answer to all of these three questions is going to be no. Regarding the first question, it would be entirely mistaken, I think, to view the switch to protection as having had causes that were fundamentally idiosyncratic and Irish. Everybody switched to protection during this period. And when everybody does the same thing, there must be an underlying cause. And the underlying cause is, of course, the Great Depression, which began in 1929. And the underlying cause of the Great Depression was the international monetary arrangements of the period, namely the gold standard. Now, what the gold standard did is it ruled out the kinds of policy responses that we saw in 2009, faced with our own Great Recession. When Gordon Brown memorably saved the world in London in April of 2009, what did they agree at that meeting? They agreed to embark in a coordinated matter on looser monetary policy, cutting interest rates or printing the stuff, and on looser fiscal policy, raising expenditure or lowering taxation. And you know what? It worked. It really did work. The gold standard, by definition, ruled out printing money or loose money policy. Your hands were tied by the link with gold. And the mentalité of the time 
was very much one that said that you couldn't be at all uh, Keynesian when it came to your fiscal policy either. And so with both policy hands tied behind their backs, policymakers everywhere resorted to the only policy lever available to them, which was protectionism. Even the British, which were unilaterally committed to free trade, who were very ideologically predisposed to free trade, where, where there was a very strong working class interest in cheap food, even they moved pretty decisively towards protection in November 31 and February 32, that is to say, before Ireland. Ireland. Was Ireland unusually protectionist during the 30s? Again, I think the answer is no. I have data here on average tariff rates in Ireland and in a sample of Western European countries for which we have data. I'm willing to bet the tariffs were even higher in countries for which I don't have data. Poland, Bulgaria, and so on, but I can't uh, prove that. We are on the higher end of the spectrum here, but our tariff rates are very similar to those in Germany, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and the UK. But to focus on tariffs is actually to miss the point, because tariffs were not the real problem during this decade. The real problem was quotas and other quantitative restrictions on trade. And when you compare the extent to which the Irish government of the 30s uh, Im imposed quotas on imports, well, we are very liberal, actually, in a comparative context here. We did so much less than, for example, the French, the Belgians, the Swiss, other countries that stuck to gold until the bitter end. Nor did we impose the sorts of exchange controls that you saw in Italy or Germany or elsewhere. So we're not unusually protectionist during the 30s. We really aren't. Now, another well-known feature of Irish economic policy during this time was its attempts to restrict the foreign ownership of foreign-based firms. But the importance and the uniqueness of the 32 and 34 Control of Manufacturers Acts can be overdone. First, as work by Mary Daly, Frank Barry, and others has revealed, these formal restrictions were often, not always, but often evaded by means of fancy legal footwork, as was indeed the case in other countries. Uh, parenthetically, I wonder whether anybody has ever inquired into whether it might be possible that Dublin legal firms built up a certain sort of expertise during this period that was used to nefarious effect during more recent events that we all remember and would prefer the rest of the world to forget. That's just speculation, we'll see. But second, Ireland wasn't by any means alone in adopting such restrictions. Spain and Finland did so in 1939, Portugal did so in 1943 and so on. Were the economic effects of protectionism uniquely destructive in Ireland? Again, I'm afraid the answer is no. Here I have yet another of these scatter plots showing Irish growth in a convergence perspective. And once again, we are bang on the line. We're growing at exactly the rate that you would have expected us to be growing at, given where we started out, which wasn't great, but this was the interwar period. Nobody was doing very well. Our performance was completely uh, typical during this period. And by the way, uh, the very notion that protectionism was necessarily bad for us in the context of the 30s can be queried. Uh, statistical analyses have shown that other things being equal, where those other things include, for example, the trading policies of your neighbors, actually protecting more might have been good for you rather than bad for you in these very specific and perverse uh, times, the 1930s, uh, when nobody could embark on export growth strategies because nobody's markets were open. Um, one thing that protection did in Ireland is it created jobs. Now, they mightn't have been the best jobs in the world. The firms involved might eventually have gone out of business, but they were jobs at a time when there weren't jobs available elsewhere. Uh, the emigration safety, safety valve would never have worked as well during the 1930s as would have been possible in, for example, the 50s or 60s. Well, what about the economic war then? Well, that, on the face of it, is a bit unusual, I admit. On the other hand, we were by no means alone on defaulting on our debts. There were widespread de debt defaults during this period in Latin America, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and so on. But since my focus here is on whether all of these policies were destructive in the Irish context, well, I'm not sure that the economic war was all that bad necessarily when you average things out the way that we do when we tend to say things like the transatlantic trade agreement that is currently being proposed would be good on average. Adapting that kind of crude utilitarian standard, it isn't clear that the economic war was actually so damaging. Uh, the debts that we owed the British uh, came to about 100 million pounds on a capitalized basis. Now, admittedly, that estimate was due to the Irish government at the time, and they might have been talking up the extent to which, you know, they might have been inflating this somewhat. But they were very, very substantial. 
they were settled with a one-off lump sum payment of 10 million quid, and we got the treaty ports into the bargain. Now, forget about whether you know, neutrality during World War II was a good thing or a bad thing from an ethical or a foreign policy point of view. And since this is an economics panel, let's just talk costs and benefits. Uh, would we have been able to remain neutral during World War II if we hadn't have had the treaty ports? I don't think so. And from a cost-benefit point of view, remaining neutral has got to be massively positive. A lot of Irish lives are going to be saved for sure, and maybe we avoid a good deal of property destruction uh, into the bargain. So taken as a whole, even taking account of the undoubted economic costs of the economic war from 32 to 38, it's far from clear that the net balance sheet ends up looking negative. Uh, although, of course, big farmers uh, you know, never forgot what happened, and they've been lying in the long grass waiting for Fianna Fáil at election time ever since, much like those blue-collar workers uh, that we're hearing so much about in America, Britain, and elsewhere. Now, the war itself was a very difficult period in Ireland. Uh, we really did have to become much more autarkic and self-sufficient than even Mr. de Valera would have wanted. Uh, imports of energy and so on are cut. Industry suffers terribly. Uh, and we don't benefit as much from England's uh, difficulties in terms of being able to uh, sell lots of food to them at inflated prices. It was a pretty bad time, but it's hardly fair to blame Irish policymakers for the deprivations of World War II, I would suggest. Nor is it fair, I think, to credit them with the inevitable post-war recovery that followed. So taken as a whole, I would argue that the period between about 1922, and the, uh, precisely 1922, and about 1950, was one in which our policy choices were entirely typical, except that we were unusually liberal for an unusually long period of time, and in which our performance was also entirely typical as well. In sharp contrast, Irish performance during the subsequent 25 years, from, 19, from 1950 to 73, uh, what is known by economic historians as the European Golden Age, which they still remember nostalgically uh, in France as the Trente Glorieuse, the Wirtschaftswunder in Germany and so on, this is where we really fall behind in a comparative European context. Now, that picture, which is showing you the data in the 1950s, shouldn't come as any surprise. As you can see, we're massively underperforming in this kind of a convergence perspective. And I would just make the point, since you know, I, I, I do want to acknowledge that there have been policy failures in this country, that these national income data are understating the case for Irish failure. Because, of course, at the self-same time, the British are building up the NHS, but there are modern welfare states being created all around Europe, and we lag well behind them. So if you're interested in the welfare of ordinary people, and especially of poorer people, this is one decade where you really can say that Ireland did very poorly indeed. But we all knew that the 1950s were pretty lousy. What may come as more of a surprise to you is that even after 1958 and all that good stuff that happened with Whitaker and Lamas and so on, we're still massively underperforming within a broader European context. This is the period when Greece and Portugal especially start their economic miracles, start very quickly converging towards the European income frontier. We're still lagging well behind. Now, one point to make is that if you were focused uniquely on the comparison with the United Kingdom, you'd have completely missed this, because we are actually growing more rapidly than them. But the point is, of course, that growing more rapidly than an economy that is doing extraordinarily poorly is nothing to write home about. Why was Irish performance so poor during these two crucial decades? I want to highlight three reasons. The first has to do with recurrent balance of payments crises. The second has to do with delayed liberalization. I want to put a bit of the blame on us. And the third has to do with our excessive dependence on the poorly performing British economy. So first of all, balance of payments crises. A very obvious feature of the economic landscape in Ireland during the, er the 50s and early 60s that would have been very evident to you at the time, but, we, but which we're much less prone to comment on today, was this market succession of booms and busts. That post-war boom that I alluded to briefly earlier came to an end as a result of a balance of payments crisis that emerged in 1950 and got worse in 51. Uh, basically, we recovered, we spend more money, we spend more money on imports, uh, imports increase, the balance of trade gets worse, 
what are we going to do about it? During this period, you can't borrow. There isn't a lot of international borrowing or lending going on. So you have to adjust. And how do you adjust? You adjust through austerity. In this case, we adjusted we, uh, through a, an austerity budget, as we call it today, in April 1952, that caused a deep recession. And of course, when you do that, your balance of payments uh, does improve because nobody can afford to buy anything anymore, uh, not even imports. So it worked. Uh, but at the cause of uh, damaging the economy. By 55, the economy is recovering, consumption's booming again, imports are again rising rapidly, and yet again the response is not one but two austerity budgets in 1956, uh, leading yet again to a deep recession that lasted for several years. And something similar happens, as you can see on the slide, 10 years later. This sequence of booms and busts was highly destructive and it naturally poses the question of whether Irish policymakers were uniquely incompetent. And my answer to that question is that they were not, because precisely the same sequence of events was well known in Britain at the time. Here is the British economic policy uh, steeplechaser uh, who has just surmounted the previous crisis only to find the next crisis looming up ominously ahead. And it was for essentially the same reasons. Uh, whenever the economy started doing well, they'd run into balance of payments problems and they'd have to slam on the fiscal brakes. Now the word that was used at the time to describe this sequence of policy events was stop-go policies. And these were analysed in a famous contribution by Trevor Swan, an Australian macroeconomist, uh, more or less around this time. And his essential point was that, well, governments were trying to hit two policy targets simultaneously. They were trying to hit a full employment target, an internal balance target, if you will, and they were also trying to hit uh, a trade balance target, an external balance target, if you will. Now, if you're an archer in an archery competition and you have to hit two targets, you need at least two arrows. And similarly, if you're an economic policymaker and you're trying to hit two policy targets, you need at least two policy instruments. And the problem was that during this period, they only had one. And this is because of, yet again, an international monetary system. In this case, the Bretton Woods system, uh, according to which everybody pegged their exchange rates to the dollar. And what that meant is that countries didn't have a monetary policy instrument or an exchange rate instrument at their disposal. They were left with fiscal policy. And you can't hit two targets with just one arrow. The problem was that if your currency was overvalued, then you face persistent balance of trade problems. Your, your goods were too expensive on international markets, and so there was constantly this tendency for you to import more than you were exporting. What do you do? Well, you can't devalue, and so you, you slam on the fiscal brakes, you cut expenditure, that lowers consumption and imports, but at the cost of rising unemployment, you then react to that, you, 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 you loosen up on fiscal policy, uh, balance of trade problems emerge, and so on and so forth. What's the ultimate solution? The ultimate solution is, of course, to devalue. But policymakers only tended to do that under duress. For example, as a result of the 67 crisis in Britain that led Harold Wilson to devalue uh, the pound, and uh, the Irish pound too, by the way, I should say. And I, I do think that there is something to be said for looking at Irish short-run macroeconomic fluctuations by thinking about what British currency policy was during the periods concerned. Britain had a very lousy 1920s because their currency was overvalued. I don't think we think the 20s were all that brilliant in Ireland either, despite our liberal trade policy. And they had a relatively benign 1930s after they devalued the gold standard. Maybe there were knock-on effects for us there as well. Well, until we were willing to sever the link with sterling, uh, we were sort of stuck with this. Uh, it's unsurprising that there would have been a succession of booms and busts. And by the way, this is just a measure of business cycle fluctuations in the British and Irish economies. And as you can see, they're actually very highly correlated with each other during this period. So my first explanation for poor performance during the European Golden Age is this stop-go dilemma. The second explanation is, of course, delayed liberalization. I've argued that protectionism was fairly appropriate and uh, anyway inevitable during the 30s, but by the 50s it was clearly no longer appropriate. You could embark on export-oriented growth strategies because other countries were opening themselves up to international trade, largely at the behest, it must be said, of the United States, which was a big backer of the OEEC, uh, the, the forerunner of today's OECD, uh, and the European Payments Union, uh, and of the EEC. It was less clear about EFTA, the, the British baby. They were less clear about that for reasons that I don't have time to go into. 
Um, and we were slow to jump onto that liberalization back bandwagon, and that was a costly mistake. However, the traditional picture of an Ireland that was completely resistant to change before 58 is oversimplistic. We were a founder member of the OEC and of the European Payments Union. Um, this slide here shows that in 1950, we were the second most liberal country in the OEC, uh, behind only Switzerland, when it came to uh, resorting to quotas. It's true that after that, we are slower to liberalize than the rest of Europe, but that's partly because there was less liberalization to, to, be, to do in the first place. Over the period as a whole, actually, we are really pretty typical on this dimension. On the other hand, we were slower to lower our tariff barriers than the core European economies. We behaved rather like the other peripheral European economies I've been comparing ourselves to, the Greeks, the Finns, the Spains, and so on. And interestingly, that slow reduction in tariffs persists into the 1960s, even after the famous 58 shift. On the other hand, uh, we were relatively precocious in seeking uh, foreign direct investment. The IDA is founded in 1949. The Export Board, later Chorus Troctola, is established in 1950. Tax relief on export profits is introduced in 56. It's not as if nothing is happening before 1958. When we do liberalize, is this an unusual thing? Is the timing unusual? I'm going to argue that it's actually quite typical of a certain group of peripheral European economies. They're all responding to the, the signature of the Treaty of Rome. And then that leads to a whole bunch of other knock-on effects, particularly on Britain. The British, first of all, tried to sabotage the Treaty of Rome negotiations. That failed. They then moved to a Plan B or Plan G, uh, as it was called. Uh, they wanted an industrial free trade area within Western Europe. They misjudged other countries' interests. Other countries actually wanted to export food. Uh, and so that failed. They finally end up with EFTA, the European Trade Free Trade uh, Agreement. Uh, that establishes industrial free trade rapidly within its members and aims to do a trade deal with the EEC, which it does, in fact, eventually succeed in doing. Faced with this complete reshuffling of the landscape, peripheral countries everywhere have to respond. And so, in 1959, you have uh, Spain uh, abandoning a very long-standing uh, autarkic uh, policy stance. You have Portugal joining EFTA in 1960. You have Finland uh, negotiating a trade agreement with EFTA in 1961. You have the Greeks uh, negotiating an associate uh, membership with the, uh, well, it's an associate agreement that they negotiate with the EEC uh, in 1962. So that's when everybody's doing it. And well, the timing is identical in our case because we take the plunge in 61 right at the same time as everybody else do. We say we, we want to be a part of the EEC. It's hardly our fault that de Gaulle vetoes uh, the British bid in 1963. We had taken the plunge in 61. Uh, when he vetoes the bid, we immediately unilaterally cut tariffs. We do so again in 64. We sign the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement in 1965. Now, what I think is unusual about our liberalization during this period is that it's because of the sequence of events and because of history and geography, you unusually focused on Britain alone. Uh, and I don't think that's helpful. Uh, to be sure, the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement was viewed as a stepping stone towards EEC membership, and we judge uh, actions morally and so on, intellectually by their motivation. But in practice, this was a free trade agreement not with the EEC, but just with Britain, which is a poor performer economically during this period. And it just isn't going to be as easy for the IDA to sell us as an export platform into Britain and the Commonwealth as it's going to be for it to sell us as an export platform into the EEC after 1973. And so that leads us on to the third explanation for our poor performance during the Golden Age, which was our unusual dependence on Britain. Now, I think the comparison with Greece and Portugal is telling. In the 60s, we were still doing badly, as I've said, but they were doing very well indeed. And if you look at Greek tariffs in the 1960s, they're actually higher than Irish tariffs. So if you have a simple-minded monocausal view that says low tariffs must lead to immediate growth, then you have a problem here. Why did the Greeks do so well? Well, I think that it has something to do with the fact that their opening involved an association agreement with the entire EEC in 1962. That provided continent-wide markets for cheap consumer goods produced in Greece. It provided a major incentive for, for foreign direct investment in the country. 
between 62 and 64, more than 60% of all manufacturing export in Greece was foreign. And similarly, in Portugal, uh, the amount of FDI coming into the country um, is multiplied 30-fold uh, after their accession to EFTA compared to what had been the case during the previous uh, two decades. So I think that a key difference is that our liberalization, for perfectly understandable reasons, was really focused on this much smaller and less dynamic British market. We tend to assume, and understandably so, that once we'd signed the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement, we were, to all intents and purposes, a free trader, and there's something to that. Local firms had to adjust to British competition, and that was good for efficiency. But there's a big, big difference between linking yourselves to one country alone and to a continent-wide market on the other. One very striking feature of the data between 1954, which is when they become available, and 1973, is that in this convergence perspective, our growth performance is remarkably similar to the performances of Northern Ireland and Wales. And it does make you wonder whether there isn't something going on here. Could it be a common institutional failing of one sort or another? For example, our fragmented trade union structure, which we inherited uh, from Britain, which made it much more difficult to engage in the kinds of corporatist deals that were the vogue then in continental Europe. Well, another obvious common factor is you know, the fact that we were all excessively dependent on the British plus Irish regional economy. That wasn't doing well. And so while in the 1960s, this is the red line here, Irish income was growing as a share of Britain, we were catching up on Britain. Simultaneously, our, share, our, our income relative to France, that's the blue line, is continuing to fall. We're falling further and further behind mainland Europe, even though we're catching up uh, on Britain. Now, all that immediately changes in 1973. In 1973, we immediately stop falling further behind France, and then we start converging rapidly after the second major shift, uh, which is the single market program of the late 80s and early 1990s. Now, it's true that after 73, a lot of other things happened that affected both Irish and French growth. The oil crises of the 70s, the high unemployment, the high inflation, the higher unemployment as governments tried to squeeze inflation out of the system. All those things happened in Ireland as well as France, and they hurt us. And yet, even before the Irish miracle of the 1990s, during the 1973 to 1990 period, Ireland again is just about precisely growing as rapidly as it should have been uh, given where we had started. What's the secret? FDI, based on selling into the EEC, even then is important, and the common agricultural policy would probably have been much more important then than now, since agriculture was at that time a major uh, share of our total economy. And then this is what happens after 1990. I've left out the boom and bust, or the bubble and the bust of the noughties. I've just taken the story ahead to 2001. This is our golden uh, age. We were an extraordinary over-performer. Um, I think that this comparison with Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales is informative in its own way. Here I've graphed our income per capita relative to the UK average, and also Scotland, well, Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish income per capita relative to the UK average. The, the convergence on the UK in the 60s, I think, can be viewed as being some sort of a delayed convergence process within the context of this British plus Irish regional economy. But look at that. That's, that's something completely different. Now, this, is, this is qualitatively uh, different. And what it seems to me to suggest is that the, not only was the EU fundamental in transforming uh, Irish economic fortunes, but that Irish independence was essential in exploiting the opportunities afforded to us by EU membership. As the comparison with the other Celtic nations of these islands suggests, we would never have done as well out of the EU as we in fact did had we remained a mere region of the UK. What does the, it give you? Political independence, it gives you policy flexibility at a time of rapid change. And that's exactly uh, what we were able to avail of. And we uh, developed a policy mix that was well suited to our own uh, circumstances. Now, again, I want to just highlight that we're not the only small country to have done well out of Europe. There's a whole political science literature that talks about the advantages of being small, which I kept on thinking of when I heard the Scottish debate of a couple of years ago. Scotland's too small to do well. Well, this makes no sense if you think about uh, you know, how many small countries have actually done well within the context of a European market. Being small means you're nimble, means you're flexible, means you can get your act together when circumstances change much more rapidly than big countries sometimes can. 
Now, we all know what the policy mix was that we chose, low, low corporation tax rate and other incentives for inward investment, including education in education and infrastructure. Karma Grada and I have also argued that social partnership was also important at a critical time in the late 80s and early 90s. It moderated wage growth and provided a stable industrial relations environment. So we finally come up with something like the corporatism of Germany, Austria, Scandinavia, and so on, of the 50s and 60s. It was just you know, 30 years too late in some sense. And there's an interesting kind of... I won't use the word neoliberal, but there's an interesting 1990s twist. Those workers in... Uh, the 50s and 60s in continental Europe were, to a certain extent, compensated for their wage moderation by states uh, building up big welfare programs that uh, helped them in many ways. Our workers, of course, were compensated largely with tax reductions, and time will tell whether that's an equally sustainable way to do these things. Since 1973, and even more so since 1990, we've become a hyper-globalized economy whose subsequent economic history has, measured, me, has mirrored the ebbs and flows of the global economy in highly exaggerated fashion. When it does well, we do absolutely fantastically well, and when it has a little recession, we have a deep uh, depression. The recession of the 1980s, as inflation was squeezed out of the Western economic system, the Clinton Greenspan IT boom of the 1990s, the credit and housing bubbles of the so-called Great Moderation, uh, the subsequent crash after 2008, the subsequent recovery. Well, Ireland, these are all worldwide phenomena, and we've experienced all of them, but in spades. This heightened sensitivity to international economic conditions in partly reflects our amazing openness, but it also, I think, reflects probably an Irish tendency to spend when times are good and to borrow when they're not, a tendency which, however, I should also say seems to be shared by many other English-speaking countries. Here's a slide uh, to make our chairman, who is very, you know, fiscally responsible, uh, happy, I hope. This, is, this, is, this justifies your position, John. So, so this is a, a crude measure of GDP volatility. It's, it's showing you how volatile GDP is. And what you can see is that the black line is the OECD. GDP becomes much more volatile during the 70s, of course but then they gradually become more and more moderate. But our volatility has been stuck at 1970s levels, and if anything, even increased during the 80s and 90s. And that's even before the extraordinary thing that we know happened after 2000. So there is a problem there. Now, it's true also that if you do the same thing for the other pigs, the Greeks, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and so on, you see that we're, we're not standing out noticeably ahead of the pack. We have a sort of peripheral level of GDP volatility. But noting that point does nothing to diminish the problem. And moderating this volatility, John, I'm sure we all agree, uh, should be a major policy priority for the country going forward. Now, of course, the other major priority that we face is adjusting to Brexit and perhaps to the economic consequences of a Trump presidency as well, and maybe we'll be talking about this in the questions and answers afterwards. Exactly what challenges Brexit will imply is unclear, and it will remain unclear until the British government decide what they want to do. I don't think they do know what they want to do yet. There's a huge row going on in London, and we have to hope that they go for a softer Brexit, but it may be that they go for a harder Brexit uh, by default. There's no doubt in my mind but that hard Brexit would be, well, it would be a, an unfriendly act, not in the sense that they're trying to hurt us. Of course, they're not. They like us, actually. They like us quite a lot. But in the sense that they were doing something, they would be doing something that they would know would be hurting us quite a bit, and they'd be doing so regardless. You know? uh, but there's nothing unusual about that, actually, and we shouldn't feel hard done by. I mean, the Irish, of all people, should be able to understand that people behave in a self-interested manner. Look at our corporate tax policy over the past you know, 50, 60 uh, years. It's entirely natural that a big country like England pursue its own interests without taking too much account of the interests of smaller countries on these islands, which is why, in my view, Irish independence was always both inevitable and desirable, but that's another matter. Now, because a hard Brexit would damage Irish interests, it's logical that we should desire that our nearest neighbours not proceed with it. But it's important that this desire not lead us to engage in wishful thinking. Once Britain has left the EU, the EU will be obliged, not under EU law, but under world trade law, to impose tariffs on imports coming from Britain. It isn't something that the EU can avoid. It will be obliged to do this because if it didn't, it would be discriminating in favour of Britain and against its other trading partners, and that would be illegal. 
The only circumstance in which the EU would be allowed to not impose tariffs on British goods is if there were a legally registered free trade agreement of some sort in place at the moment that Brexit occurs. And there are two major problems here because the clock is going to start ticking and it's going to start running very, very quickly once they send in the Article 50 negotiation. There'll only be two years at that stage. And there are two problems. Firstly, I'm not a lawyer. I did glance at the treaties. They give a major role, the European treaties, that is, they give a major role to the European Council in directing trade negotiations with third countries. The Council directs trade negotiations with third countries. And the problem is that until Brexit occurs, the UK is a part of the Council. So how can you have a country negotiating with itself? There are people in Brussels and the legal services, I believe, who think quite sincerely that it's just legally impossible to engage in substantive trade negotiations with Britain until Brexit has occurred. So it'll have to wait. So that would be bad news for us, but that may, I think, be the legal situation. Even if it isn't, even if you know, we get Arthur Cox out there and they sort out you know, this little technicality, uh, it's also the case that there's absolutely no way that we're going to get a detailed trade agreement with Britain in place in two years. These things take years and years and years to negotiate. There's zero possibility of a comprehensive deal between the EU and UK being ironed out within uh, two years. So if we're going to avoid tariff barriers, even between, either between the Republic and the North, or preferably, from our point of view, between Ireland and Britain, we're going to need some sort of a transitional deal that can be easily agreed on within two years without too much substantive negotiating being involved. Uh, a detailed, bespoke transitional agreement seems impossible. It'll be just as difficult to negotiate as a permanent agreement. Apart from anything else, transitional agreements have a habit of lasting for a long, long time. And if it isn't bespoke, then it's going to have to be off the shelf. And there's only a limited number of off the shelf agreements out there. The British could choose to become temporarily members of the European Economic Area, like Norway, for example. They could choose to become temporary members of the European Customs Union, for example. If they decide that they don't want either of those options or some other equally easily available alternative on even a transitional basis, which is important, then hard Brexit becomes inevitable. And it's very important that in our country, uh, we be clear that in such a circumstance, it will be British choices and not anybody else's that will have caused this outcome. Now, the problem for Ireland is that although our prosperity is based on our membership of the EU single market, a comparatively high share of our exports still go to Britain. Now, it's important to be clear, the British export market is tiny compared to the EU export market. We sell about 13, 13 to 14% of our exports to Britain. We sell 40% to the rest of the EU. So that EU market is three times more important than the UK market. Um, no sane Irish politician would choose ever the British market over the far larger European one. You know, on the other hand, if you focus just on agriculture, which is over there on the left, which as you can see is no longer such a huge deal within the global scheme of things. And if you look at the percentages within each of these categories going to these different uh, destinations, you can see that in agriculture, Britain still is our major market. And many of our smaller, more labor intensive indigenous industries also still sell a lot there. If you're a small operation, it's much easier for all sorts of understandable reasons to sell to Britain than it is to sell to France or Germany or whatever. And we're gonna to have to do something about that, actually. Um, and this is a problem because if there is a hard Brexit, then food and agricultural tariffs are much higher than average tariffs. So this really will be a problem for us, and it'll be a huge problem for the North, I think, a really terrible problem for the North, potentially. If you think about the milk in Tesco that comes from the North and so on, they are the ones who are going to lose out the most from this, in my view. Another potential concern is the fact that, well, to me, a surprisingly large share of our physical merchandise exports are still being shipped to, and in some cases, through the UK. That's not true for container traffic. It is true for roll-on, roll-off traffic. And again, I can imagine that the small mom-and-pop firms are more likely to put their stuff on a lorry than to put their stuff in a container. Now, maybe the English would be, ha be helpful to us and have an EU-only fast lane as we approach uh, Dover, but I kind of doubt it, actually. So again, this is something that we might want to do something about. So Brexit means we're going to have to adjust. How well we adjust will define our future prosperity over the course of the next couple of decades, but we're going to have to adjust anyway, since the kind of hyper-globalization that we've been so good at exploiting is, as we've seen, becoming politically unsustainable throughout the Western world. We do not want to find ourselves on the wrong side of history. 
Good news is other countries have faced similar challenges. Think of Finland in 1991. USSR collapses. It's their big trading partner. They adjusted and admirably. Think of my mother's country, Denmark, after 1879. They lose their German export markets. They uh, re-switch their entire agricultural sector. They switch the product mix. They start selling stuff to the British rather than to the Germans. Think of ourselves in the 1960s when all of those indigenous manufacturing firms found themselves exposed to foreign competition for the first time. We've adjusted before. We'll have to do so again. It's time to conclude. I've argued that Irish prosperity in recent decades has depended both on our membership of the EU and on our political independence, which allowed us to make the most of that membership. Independence would never have worked as well for us had it not been for the EU. Uh, the EU would never have worked as well for us as it did had it not been for our independence. I've also pointed out that much the same has been true for several other small European countries. Once again, our own national story is part of a bigger picture. We're not actually so different as we sometimes think we are. Of course we've made mistakes. It would have been downright odd if we hadn't, especially in the context of the 20th century. But our mistakes, our mistakes were not particularly unusual or especially egregious, and they were eventually remedied. And isn't it the case, whether we're dealing with individual human beings or with entire nations, that having the freedom to make your own mistakes and learn from them rather than being permanently subjected to the consequences of other mistakes and getting gradually more resentful over time. Isn't it that ability to make your own mistakes and learn from them what freedom is all about? Or Margaret. So thank you, uh, Kevin, for that impressively uh, wide-ranging and thought-provoking lecture. And thank you, too, for uh, the ringing endorsement of uh, fiscal responsibility. <laughs> much, much appreciated. Uh, and I think your, your uh, provocative thesis that uh, we weren't all that different, despite what we might like to think, uh, tees up our respondents uh, uh, extremely well. Uh, so I will uh, uh, introduce them uh, uh, one by one just before they come up, uh, and we'll uh, take them in alphabetical order, um, uh, and each respondent will have uh, eight minutes. So our first respondent is Professor Alan Barrett, uh, who is the Director of the Economic and Social Research Institute, and also Chairperson of the National Economic Dialogue, and he previously uh, was a colleague of mine on the Fiscal Advisory Council, and Alan will discuss uh, the equality of opportunities and outcomes for children. Kevin just told me he was getting his pen. He obviously doesn't trust a Dublin Northsider with his, uh, his, his stuff anywhere close by. So I'm su suitably offended, Kevin. But anyway, that's the... Uh, so, some things don't change 100 years on. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a change of pace, uh, or a change of style, uh, I suppose. So I'm, I'm going to talk about, in a sense, something completely different. Okay, and the question I'm, I'm going to talk about is this one, are we cherishing all the children equally? Uh, and although I'm talking about it, I, I should uh, be very honest and clear here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, it's, it's based on a book that was published uh, about two weeks ago uh, by my colleagues James Williams, Emer Smith and Dorothy Watson of the ESRI and Elizabeth Nixon uh, from Trinity College Dublin. So a little bit of, uh, I suppose, a motivation and just to link it to Kevin. So Kevin was very much talking about Irish economic performance uh, over the last number of, of years, or over the last hundred years. And I suppose I'm going to just start asking the question, bringing it up to, to modern days, and ask, well, how are we using the fruits of the economic progress that we've used? And then specifically, I want to talk about the outcomes for children, and I suppose drawing on that famous phrase from the proclamation, I'm going to ask the question, are, in 2016 this is, are we cherishing all the children equally? Okay, now I know there's historians in the audience, so I'm going to be very, very clear doing this at the outset. I, I know it is, it is understood that when uh, Pierce and colleagues refer to cherishing the children, they weren't talking about children in the literal sense. Okay, so we're, we're, at the Institute, we're using a little bit of poetic license uh, on this one. But nevertheless, I think the, the, the phrase is a sort of a very challenging phrase and a very, very interesting one. 
So it just so happened that the 100th anniversary of the rising coincided with the, the 10th anniversary of the Growing Up in Ireland survey, which the ESRI does in combination with uh, Trinity. And for those who don't know, uh, the Growing Up in Ireland survey is probably along with the longitudinal study on ageing, one of the most ambitious social science projects. Uh, so over the last 10 years, the Institute and Trinity have been following 17,000 children. Uh, again, and it's one of these longitudinal studies whereby we interview the same kids every two or three years. So again, the phrase growing up in Ireland is quite literally captured in the nature of the survey because we're you know, following the same kids, so we're allowed to sort of uh, investigate how their trajectories unfold and how their, uh, sort of in particular, their, the initial characteristics are gonna determine their outcomes. So this is the survey, in a sense, I'm gonna be using uh, to try and get a handle on this question as to whether or not we are indeed cherishing all the children equally. Now, I'm gonna be saying negative things in a few minutes, which suggests that we're not actually doing as good a job as you might have thought, but let's set this in a, a sort of a broader picture and let's acknowledge uh, some of the very positive things that have happened in Ireland actually over the last 100 years with regard to children. So one very, very basic indicator that is often used here is, is, is infant mortality. Uh, I did, couldn't get the figures going all the way back to 1916 or the early 20s. I'm sure Kevin probably has it uh, somewhere. But uh, in 1960, our infant mortality rate, uh, the, the, there was a little over a 30 deaths per live thousand births. That is now down to three per thousand. And just to give a sort of a, an international comparison, in 2015 there, the, the, the figure of 30 per thousand, is, is, that's Bangladesh today. So Ireland in, the in 1960 was similar to Bangladesh today in terms of infant mortality. But obviously that is something that we've made a huge amount of progress on. Education, I think, is an area that most people in this room are going to understand, uh, that we had one of the sort of, you know, the, the, the great um, social policies of the last 100 years was the extension of secondary education in the 1960s. We've done extremely well at uh, increasing the number of people going on to third level as well, so I think that would be another positive. Child protection uh, is obviously an issue uh, that's tremendously sensitive, and this is something, of course, that we learned a huge amount about in recent years, how bad we had been on this particular issue. But perhaps as a result and a sort of reaction to the very dire situation, Ireland actually now has one of the most sort of robust um, sort of systems of, of child protection. Our laws around things like disclosure are very much sort of, uh, you know, at the leading edge of these sort of things, and again, that's been a very, very positive development. And I'm also going to make great, uh, reference to the children's rights uh, referendum. Uh, I think, the, again, there are lawyers in the audience, so I'm not going to say a huge amount about this, but for many years in Ireland, legally, the concept of children was really buried somewhere in the concept of family. And children really didn't have independent identities in any sort of a legal sense. So the children's rights referendum of a number of years ago really made a difference here and gave a different legal identity to children. And of course, we're one of the few countries with an actual dedicated ministry uh, for children. So because we run the Growing Up in Ireland survey in the Institute, we regularly have international folks who come over uh, who are experts in, in, in this whole area of, of children and child development and they continually are just impressed with the fact that Ireland has really sort of invested political capital and legal capital in this area. So those are the, the sort of the, the, the good things and again the, the, the legal dimensions I think have been very very positive. But let's start asking about some of the other questions. And again, with only eight minutes, I will move through these pretty rapidly. And I suppose I want to ask is, how much do your initial life circumstances dictate your life outcomes? Or alternatively, are children in Ireland getting an equal start in life? All right, and I'm gonna look across this, I've just got four slides on this and we'll talk about each in turn. Okay, so language development. All right, so under the GUI survey, the, the first interviews happened for a bunch of kids when they were nine months old, okay? So we interviewed at least the family of children, of 8,000 families where the children were nine months old, and we bent back and we talked to them when they were three years old, okay? Same group. And I don't know how you react to this, but I personally found this somewhat shocking. Is that too strong a word for it? I don't know. But at the age of three, you're able to do very, very basic vocabulary tests. All right, and it's around what sort of words can, can kids recognize. And as you'll see from my final bullet point there, even at the age of three, a socioeconomic gradient is emerging okay, across the kids' abilities. So for this particular test, just to give you some sort of, you've got an average score of 74.6, 
So if your mother has no secondary schooling, the kid's average score was 63.7. If the mother has a postgraduate education, it's 78.7. Uh, so it's quite, and if I was to show all the education levels, you get a perfect line, okay? It's not just that there's, you know, at the extremes, this thing rises on a socioeconomic uh, gradient. And as I said, that's on the age of three. So then the kids go on to school. Okay, and again, one of the things we did when the kids were five now, then this is again the value of going back and continually investigating. So at the age of five, we were going, able to pick up on things like attitude, dispositions, and, and language uh, again as the kids are going into school. Okay? I haven't put up the precise figures on this, but just to assure you that mother's education and household income again provide you with a perfect relationship. All right? And that's, that socioeconomic gradient is there. And again, what's slightly scary about this is it even begins to intensify between the ages of three and five. Okay, I'm gonna take two examples then from health. And again, this is another one of the great values of the Growing Up in Ireland survey, in that there's a whole range of different dimensions uh, you know, that, the kids, that, that we ask about the kids. So you can really get this sort of comprehensive uh, sense of what's going on. So low birth rate, is generally understood uh, to be a difficulty, and I won't go into the, the details over there. Okay, but again, the statistics, 7.9% of children from the lowest income families were found to be low birth rate, compared to 46 from the highest income families. So when I talk, was talking about language development, I was talking about three. We're actually now back to the very beginning of life, and again, the socioeconomic gradient is there. Does that matter? Well, again, what we're able to do is, because we're tracking the kids over time, we're able to identify if you had a low birth rate at the start, are there implications later on in life? And as you can see, uh, at nine months of age, there's different motor skills, okay? And then going up to nine years of age, you're getting different scores on reading and maths tests as a result of the low birth rate. And again, without going into sort of all the econometrics that's behind this, when we do these sort of analysis, we try and you know, take account of a whole range of other factors that might be going on that are influencing these things. Second last slide, John, in case you're worried. Okay, obesity. Uh, I was at a conference recently, and, and this was put extraordinarily strongly. Uh, a person at the conference said that he was of the view that a child has a human right not to be obese. Okay, that there is something about her society at the moment that uh, childhood obesity is becoming a real issue, and this person put it in these sort of dramatic terms. So we all know there's a childhood obesity problem, but again, I think the fascinating point to emerge from uh, the research that's been undertaking is that there is a socioeconomic gradient even in this. Okay, so the children of unskilled manual parents are 65% more likely to be obese at age three than the children of professional parents. And we have now discovered that if you project that forward up to the age of, um, well certainly for one group at the age of uh, 17, uh, we're already picking up different blood pressure problems across obese and non-obese kids. So you can imagine the, you know, again, the sort of, the, 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 the whole range of difficulty that, that, that arises. I haven't tried to go in here now between the links between health and education, so on and so forth, but the GUI uh, data allows you to do this, but you can basically, I think, get a sense from what I'm saying that with this sort of collection of disadvantaged outcomes early on in life, there is something troubling going on. Last slide, and I'm gonna quote directly here from the book because this is the easiest way of doing it. <coughs> Academics typically write, and they typically end with, with you know, reports or studies or papers, with, 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 often with kind of anemic um, conclusions or whatever like that because I think there's a, a natural academic reluctance to say anything too strong because you always think there might be another study out there that might say something. But the guys who wrote, who edited the book, put it in terms of, have we reached a position in the Ireland of 2016 which suggests that we do, in fact, cherish all the children equally? And again, this is quoting directly on the book. On the basis of the evidence presented throughout the book, it would appear, regrettably, that the answer must be no. I think that's elegant, eloquent rather. I won't go any further. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, our next respondent is Professor Mary Corcoran, who is uh, Professor of Sociology and Head of Sociology at Maynooth University. Uh, now, Mary predicted beforehand that the men on the panel would not be able to keep to eight minutes because we're incapable of following the rules. Alan almost made it, but uh, uh, I'll be looking to uh, Tony Owen and, and Connor to prove her wrong. But first, Mary. 
Okay, we'll be started on that here, folks. Rubbing the chairman up the wrong way. It's not the way to go. Okay, I'm going to really try and do this quickly. Um, I am, first of all, I'd like to say I really am so happy to be here. It's a real pleasure. Um, and it's an honour, and thank you very much, Nicholas, for the invitation. So Kevin has outlined a narrative account of Ireland's recent economic history that's, you know, arguing there's nothing particularly exceptional about either the policies pursued or the attendant outcomes. And he does also say, though, that um, uh, moderating volatility in the economy needs to be a major policy uh, priority going forward. And his paper ends, obviously, by reintroducing the notion of uncertainty as we ponder our future in the shadow of Brexit on the one hand and Trumpism on the other. And I think we can all be forgiven for feeling a little bit punch drunk this week, at least I am anyway. It's a week in which a, a really dystopian political project has inexplicably become a harsh reality and reminds us all of how we felt last June when we thought, you know, the world had ended with Brexit. So we're left pondering the fallout uh, for ourselves, for the European Union, and for the US, and, and obviously uh, Kevin has addressed that. Both those political events have engendered catastrophic thinking about economic futures, globalization, the body politic, about the political price that we pay for creating ghettos of disenchantment, abandonment, marginalization, intolerance. So we can surmise from uh, Kevin's paper the advantages of living in a relatively small scale economically flexible and politically stable liberal democracy. Thank God. Um, and we also know that we have been living through some very testing times. And yet we have not retreated into an extreme kind of political position taking such as occurred in the US and in Britain. So I'm interested in the fact that our economic volatility has not been mirrored by a social instability. And I want to use my eight minutes, probably about six and a half at this point, uh, really to argue, to adva advance the view that social stability in part derives from everyday civicism that we practice all of the time, but which a lot of the time goes under the radar. So let me just elaborate a little on that. Richard Sennett has written very eloquently about the twin notions of civility and respect. Our capacity to be strangers to each other, yet able to be in each other's company. And he writes about the creation of civil interfaces, which the accretion of which in a way produces the kind of latticed work that holds society together, and you know, which we saw unraveling both in Britain recently and in the United States. So Senate and others put their faith in what they talk about as the public realm, a space that is relatively open to all, inclusive, with no cost of entry, where people can congregate, communicate, encounter each other, not in intensive ways, but in fleeting exchanges that are founded on a sense of mutual confidence and trust. And those spaces, I argue, are crucial to generating a sense of subjective competency and collective belonging. And they contribute to the title of our uh, session, the well-being of the citizen. And I actually think they also guard against populism. Now, we know that in Ireland, like in other liberal democracies, the institutional public realm, as represented by publicly provided goods and services, universities, the public media, have been, has really been in retreat and to some degree has found itself under attack in Ireland. But paradoxically, what I call, and this is a horrible word, the interstitial public realm, I'm trying to capture this sense of a place in society that is sort of ongoing, a, a taken for granted, frequently overlooked elements of our everyday life. Um, that that does embody a certain kind of publicness and public spiritedness that goes unnoticed. I'm sort of calling that everyday civicism. But I do think it's become something that is increasingly visible in the wake of the auster austerity years. I'm saying that with hope, in the wake of those years. Uh, it's possible, I think, then, to visualize a reformed republic in which the kind of values that we see in this interstitial public realm, inclusivity, tolerance, diversity, might actually diffuse into our more institutional public realm, which I think has been found wanting, and force a kind of rebalancing of the relationships between state, market, and civil society. So my argument is that to some degree, the crisis that we've lived through you know, has been a bit of an opportunity. We've all known that you know, we've gone through economic retrenchment, 
uh, we've gone through a lot of psychosocial reflection. We lost the plot. We lost the run of ourselves and we lost our economic sovereignty. So everything was going out the window. But I, what I'm saying is that if you look more closely, I think that we've demonstrated a lot of resilience. I think we've demonstrated resourcefulness and everyday civicism. And this is very visible in our cities, towns, and neighborhoods. And what I'm going to do is just give you some examples of these. And I'm using the work of Lonesberg and Bunderman, who wrote about the emergence of spaces of potential in the late 20th, early 21st century. Really trying to capture emergent public spaces around production and exchange, participation, democracy, action, virtuality, and so on. And I think that there's lots of those places around Ireland if we start looking for them, and that they are very good for this kind of uh, everyday civicism. So one of them is the urban allotments, uh, which have become hugely popular in Ireland in recent years. They challenge the mass consumer model, they reconnect people with nature, and they raise awareness about issues of environment, and sustainability. And these can be seen in every town and city in Ireland now. Uh, public libraries. Again, in Britain, the public libraries are being shut down. In Ireland, they are quietly reinventing themselves for the 21st century. They are embedded in localities and they absolutely address the needs of all, including immigrants. Um, a senior police officer once confided in me that, in his view, the most integrated space in the city of Dublin is the public library in the Blanchardstown town centre. Uh, there's lots of examples of other kinds of activity-based uh, uh, spaces of potential, and we're all familiar with these, but I like to try and group them together. I think they animate the public realm. I'm thinking of things like the annual Liffey Swim, the Dublin Marathon, public bathing spots in South Dublin and in Salt Hill. Uh, which are all open to everybody. They attract people from all walks of Irish life. I know because I swim in the 40 foot during the summer. They have low barriers to entry. Uh, and they're just kind of expressions of our, I think, uniquely Irish joy in public self-flagellation. Um, <laughs> In addition to that, we have the festival culture in Ireland, 700 festival events and events staged annually the length and breadth of Ireland. And these, remember, rely on massive volunteer and goodwill efforts on the part of local communities who try to remind us of the pleasures that we can derive from art, from food, history, music, literature, and poetry. And they're also significant for the local economy. Culture Night uh, in Dublin is, of course, sorry, Culture Night around the country is a brilliant example of that. Started in 2005, in 2016, 370,000 people visited a museum, visited an art gallery in the evening time, all free and open to all. Culture Night, I think, is at one end of a continuum of in-between spaces of potential that include, or have included, pop-up art galleries, stores and performances, often in ghost buildings left over after the property crash, flash mob events, and the newly popular car boot sales. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's my car boot sale. Um, such events, I think, enliven the public space, make us re-examine some of our presuppositions, and provide creative avenues for reflecting on the issues du jour. I don't know if anyone of you managed to see this fantastic play, Guaranteed! Exclamation mark by Colin Murphy, where he simply took the transcripts, transcripts from the night of the bank guarantee and got actors to perform them as a theatrical intervention. And it toured Ireland, and after each show, there was a panel discussion with Colin, who had edited the transcripts. But who would have thought that you could make a theatrical spectacle out of you know, that night of the long knives? But you could. OK, so that brings me to 2016. Um, in 2016, we've had the commemoration. The streets of our towns and cities have become major participatory public spaces with the events marking commemoration. RTE's Road to the Rising event, staged on Easter Monday 2015, a year in advance of the official launch, used music, poetry and film to recreate the contemporary ambience of Dublin. And what I think was interesting that the whole emphasis was on the fluidity of the street, moving people through the street so they could catch staged events that evoked how that street would have been uh, 100 years ago. 
Effectively, it was kind of a history flash mob or a kind of teleportation project. And in the earlier uh, session, the experts bite back, this really came up a lot in the audience. The incredible buy-in of the Irish public to commemoration events. Historians gave talks. Uh, as I've said, 300,000 people participated, and according to the organisers, quote, they couldn't get enough of it. One historian who was involved in the event observed, and I, I don't think this has ever happened to a sociologist, that, quote, for one day, historians were the rock stars of Ireland. Uh, a year later, we come to Reflecting the Rising, produced by RTE in partnership with Ireland 2016. That, of course, took place on Easter Monday. Three quarters of a million people came in and took ownership of the capital city. There were hundreds of tour guides, thousands of volunteer stewards, joining public servants across all the major cultural and artistic institutions who gave up their time to open up normally off-limits uh, buildings to the general populace. And interestingly, these events were very self-consciously inclusive. Members of new immigrant communities participated. Uh, in choirs that performed on the day. They gave talks about being born out of struggle themselves, and historians tried to place the Irish Rising in a global context. Okay, so how much time do I have? have I... Minus two. I will just very quickly, and I will apologize to my fellow panelists. Um, so commemorative interventions, I think, created an alternative public space in the capital and other cities and towns, no barriers to entry, and where people uh, could wander in and out and where there was no compunction to participate but the invitation to do so was there. This is really fantastic because people had access to knowledge provided by experts but also exposure to the kind of lived experience recreated through sort of artistic tableau and really addressing the public as subjects and not as objects. Um, I'm going to skip my last bit and say, right, so to the very last page. So what I'm just arguing is that all of these spaces of potential constitute sites of civic engagement. They do have the effect of reanimating the Irish public realm, but they're kind of doing so from below, from below the radar. They demonstrate, I believe, that there is more to public life than the economy, that it is through the practices of everyday civicism that trust, tolerance, and solidarity are reproduced, and these are just as important to the stability of our society as economic policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. So our next uh, respondent is Anthony Foley, uh, who is a senior lecturer in economics at uh, DCU Business School uh, and also the head of the Economics, Finance and, uh, and Entrepreneurship Academic Group. Uh, Tony will discuss the particular challenges facing indigenous industry. Tony. Dear Evigan Yushlis, Moran Nordon Vanja, Concaint Livy, Corsi Chunskil Naheran. Cap may go, does Nog may engage, go vag may, Cupid no me diala. If I do it in Irish, do I get another few points? <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, the Irish economy is an excellent exporting economy. By international standards and all the usual indicators, high exports to GDP ratio, sectoral mix, we have a huge dominance of high technology products, the kind of products which are generally associated with sophisticated, highly skilled, dynamic economies like the United States, whatever about its politics, like Germany and so on. Um, but most of that is due to multinationals, which brings you to my issue, which is looking at the failure of indigenous industry to develop an export capacity. And just a couple of figures to illustrate that. Now, we all know how important the multinationals are to the economy, but generally we don't appreciate just how important they are. 84.5% of all manufactured exports, and that includes food processing and drink as manufacturing, 84% comes from multinationals. 14.5% comes from indigenous industry. Now, there are definitional issues as to what's indigenous and how we measure the data and so on. But even when we adjust for those kind of things, the multinationals dominate. 
And they dominate even more so on the indicators of sophistication and excellent industrial development. If we exclude food from, food from the equation, and to a certain extent you could argue we have a natural geological advantage in food, the rain falls, the grass grows, the cows eat the grass, and we get beef and milk, which obviously Saudi Arabia can't do in terms of its climate. So excluding food, 92.9% 92 92 of all our exports come from multinationals, 7% from indigenous firms. And of course that's now, that's, well, now is 2014 in terms of the data. So that's a long way after independence. Chemicals and pharmaceuticals account for 56% of all our manufactured exports, and the multinationals account for 98.9% of them. Indigenous firms account for just over 1%. The same medical device manufacturing, it's not a mistake, they are actually the same figures, 99% from the multinational sector, 1% from the indigenous side. Now, we're clearly good at attracting multinationals, and it's one of the great successes of the exercise of our economic sovereignty, which wouldn't have happened if we remained as a region within the European Union. But we're not so good in developing indigenous industry on the export side. Now, that's not for the want of trying. We have done almost everything you can think of over the decades to develop the industrial base in terms of grants, development agencies, tax incentives, and so on. Uh, developing universities, NIHEs with the skill mix to fit into industry and so on. So we've had an extensive use of economic sovereignty, but still not much in terms of the manufacturing indigenous performance. Now, as you've already seen from Kevin's excellent opening, that we've looked at different strategic approaches, protection, outward-looking, free trade, and so on. And the basic expectation of the free trade and outward-looking approach is that we specialize in products in which we have an advantage. It's not a miracle solution. If we don't have decent industrial skills, we can't make sophisticated products. So if we're an agricultural economy, we will concentrate on primary production, exporting live animals, as we did in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and then gradually we expect our skills capability will improve. We'll switch to a bit of value added, and then we'll go into detailed processing. And to a large extent, that's happened in food. So we've gone from live animal exports to basically having sophisticated food companies, food ingredients, and so on. And that's, as I say, happened in Ireland. If, on the other hand, we have a cheap labor abundance, as, say, South Korea, Taiwan, and so on, did in the 50s and 60s, we concentrate on the production of low-skilled products, build up a successful capability in that, and then gradually move up the chain in terms of quality, investment in product development, skills enhancement, and so on. And gradually, we will then produce better quality products. That latter situation requires what I call a costs and technical skills complementarity. By technical skills, I mean the vast mix of entrepreneurship skills, management skills, innovation, marketing skills, financing, and so on, which is necessary to develop businesses. And then the cost base is the overall cost base within the economy. But if we look at Ireland, we were definitely not in the, whether you want to take 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, we were not at the forefront of technological competence. We were a relatively underdeveloped industrial economy. Now, that's perfectly fine if the cost base is relatively low, because then the cost base enables us to produce the kind of products that we're able to produce, which are low-grade, labor-intensive products. But, as already pointed out, we had a common labor market with Britain. And the common labor market with Britain would tend to lead to an approximation of wages. Not necessarily exactly the same, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, but an approximation. In addition, we kind of inherited a lot of specialist UK trade unions whose expectations of wage rates and so on were determined by their head office expectation back in Britain. In addition, and it's a part that we tend to forget about. We inherited, by and large, the public service teachers, um, local authority officials, bin collectors, rates collectors. We inherited that from the British public service with effectively the British public service wage rate. And you might ask yourself, how far would Sinn Féin have gotten the 1918 election if they said, we're a poor country 
And what we have to do is cut our cloth to meet our needs. So when we get independence, we're going to have the wage rates of everyone involved. They wouldn't have got much support. So the expectation was that that wage rate would continue. So there we have a situation where costs are a function of the United Kingdom. And the UK, despite its weak economic growth performance, was a strong industrial power kind of at the forefront of the production of sophisticated products. So its productivity was reasonably high, its product mix was reasonably high. And of course that leads then to a mismatch between the Irish cost base, which is high determined by the United Kingdom, and the weak technological competence. Now, what would that do in terms of enterprise and products? It would mean we could set up enterprises behind protection, but it would also mean that those enterprises would be very marginal. They wouldn't evolve into strong companies, building up skills, getting into product diversification, and so on. And in addition, what we'd expect is when we move to free trade, unless there had been a dramatic improvement in the technological capability to eliminate that mismatch, they'd be wiped out. And that's largely what happened. So the industrial base established behind protection was basically wiped out in the 70s when we moved to a fuller free trade situation. In addition, notwithstanding what was said about you know, the post-war world where countries wouldn't devalue and so on, we had a most unusual lack of operation of economic sovereignty with the exchange rate. We kept the exchange rate the same. Now normally when you move from protection to export oriented, the exchange rate drops because more people want to buy imports, the demand for foreign exchange goes up and the price of it goes up. So your currency goes down. And that of course helps competitiveness. But in fact we didn't do that. We maintained parity with sterling right up to the late 1970s, which compounded the mismatch as it were between the technological and the cost base. So basically, not for the want of trying, and despite the introduction of an extensive range of industrial development support measures, some of which I've already mentioned, which involved a significant exercise of economic sovereignty, we did not develop a strong indigenous export-oriented activity, except in a couple of areas, and particularly in the food side. Unusually, by international standards, and Kevin may correct me on this, the small, technically weak Irish economy had a very efficient labor market, not just an ordinary labor market, same language, long history of um, previous emigration, so easy to integrate into the economy and so on. We had an efficient labor market with a large industrial economy neighbor um, and a high, high, high cost legacy issue in terms of independence. Very few pairs of countries, if any, would have had that situation of a small, underdeveloped economy with an absolutely free labor market with the other. And that created that mismatch, which I mentioned, between the cost base and the, technolog and the technological, which has made it very difficult, if not impossible, to develop an indigenous manufacturing capability able to compete internationally over the long term. Go to Mahagav. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Um, our next respondent is Owen O'Leary, who is Professor of Economics at uh, UCC. And Owen will draw in his recent book on Irish economic development uh, in an evaluation of our development strategy. Owen. Okay, um, I, I'm very grateful to be here and to have this opportunity to, to talk to you. I'm trying to, sum, trying to summarize a book here, which is going to be difficult in eight minutes. But anyway, we'll do our best. Um, it uh, I differs slightly with Kevin in terms of the time period. In, so I'm looking at since 1970. But also, I want to talk about our uniqueness in terms of our size. And uh, I'm going to talk about our inability to learn from past mistakes. I really, I suppose, I'm trying to focus on how we could do things better. Uh, I think comparisons are fraught with difficulty because we are a very small island. Um, and we have, uh, the, uh, multinationals have played a very unique role in, the, in this economy. And if you look at the, some, some of the data there, um, uh, Tony gave you export data for multinationals, but the, the, the 10 biggest multinationals account for one third of our exports. That's a side, that indicates that, that how, how small a country we are. 
there's also funny stuff going on with multinationals. Uh, you know, the, the productivity in the top three is 17 times the productivity in, in, the, in the next two uh, uh, CRH and DCC indigenous companies. But then you get some strange things, and I do work on innovation in Irish business. And we know that 80% of R&D spend is in multinationals, but look, they are three times less likely to innovate than Irish-owned businesses. That's because when they spend on R&D, they're also trying to minimize the corporate tax bill. In short, uh, we have a dual economy. So um, uh, let's focus on the bottom of that slide, because I want to, I want to move on a little bit. Our strategy has been export-led. I've shown in the book that uh, we can identify five internationally competitive industries. Uh, this overlaps a little bit with, with, with Tony. I think Tony was concentrating a lot on, on manufacturing, but you can see in the, three, the first three mentioned pharmaceutical, ICT, and financial services, one of them is a service industry. And then food and tourism is a service industry, but all of those five industries are internationally competitive. Um, so what can we say about the, 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 uh, what sustains superior performance in these industries? Without a doubt, in the multinational sector, uh, favourable tax is important. Urbanisation advantages are important, uh, but a lot of cities around the world are, are, can offer similar urbanisation advantages. I don't think there are clusters in Ireland, I would add. There's also the entrepreneurship in the senior managers in Irish, in Irish multinationals, a lot of them Irish uh, by birth who've been able to, to uh, um, keep a lot of these businesses in Ireland. I think food has underperformed for some of the reasons I'm saying there, and I think tourism is continually undersold. I mean, it's treated, um, you know, uh, the Minister for Tourism is usually associated with the Minister for Sport, and that's the way we treat tourism. I think it's completely undersold. It is an internationally competitive business. On the other hand, uh, I would like to argue that rent-seeking has been a very, a very long-standing problem in Ireland. Um, and this goes, uh, I'll start with the most recent crash, which was all about governments, banks, and, and construction lobbies, and there was a big problem around that, we all know. But going back in time, social partnership, I think, caused a problem around public sector benchmarking, and now cuts are being restored, and we have the issue about will the, will the pay rises be linked to productivity? But also, for many years now, the uh, Forfus used to be saying, and the Troika told us, the cost of doing business in Ireland is too high, we need to have more competition in the sheltered s sector. But when you think of outside of Ireland, I think Ireland internationally is a, a, a rent seeker par excellence because we compete on corporation tax, so we're doing, if you like, uh, taking from other countries' tax bases. So what about our government? How would I characterise the government? A lot of this is, is well known. It's highly centralised, dominated by the executive. We have a... Very, we have a, a uh, an electoral system which, which is very focused on parish pump. The, the, the three comments there about the public service are all taken from the reports done after the crash. An awful lot of group think uh, an unwillingness to challenge a deferential attitude to politicians. So I think this me means that we are uh, very prone to the destructive effects of rent seeking in this country. We have pre certain preconceptions about development. One is that the government runs the economy. Second is that we have to have foreign industry. Our, as Tony was saying, we have weak indigenous industry. They need state support to survive. I know entrepreneurs who, who would run a mile from state support. They, if they can't do it themselves, they won't go into business. And I would suggest that our strong reliance on foreign entrepreneurship, our corresponding lack of a critical mass of citizens who, who have experience of economic development, has resulted in a tendency to favour uh, rent seeking. There's a, there's a fine balance between productive and unproductive entrepreneurship, and I think we, ver we veer on, 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 on the side of unproductive entrepreneurship or rent seeking. And I think that has a lot to say about our inability to learn from past mistakes. So I characterize the policy mindset as dissociative. On the one hand, outwardly looking, that's the guy on the right, we're, 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 we're great, we're committed to the EU, we have a world class IDA which brings in multinational businesses, but on the other hand, we're inwardly error-prone, error uh, recurring debt crises, as Kevin talked about, destructive rent-seeking, but also uh, uh, the highly centralised nature of the economy and the way we run things has, has resulted in institutional disintegration. Dangers are looming. Uh, there's tax competition, I mean, Trump, etc. Uh, but that isn't just, that isn't a new issue. That's been around now for quite a long time with the Apple judgment, etc. The question is, are we a one-trick pony in our over-reliance on low tax? Can we build sustainable competitive advantage 
in this changing environment. Um, let's imagine a, 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 another way. Why not view business development as a discovery process led by entrepreneurs? Why don't we base policy on intervention, um, policy intervention on evidence, uh, which governments help to create to conditions for successful business? Imagine government resisting the, the embrace of rent seekers. Why don't we decentralize control and responsibility to regions with elected authorities having tax raising powers to facilitate bottom up development? Imagine a regional strategy which is, had, was an urban hierarchy with Dublin at the apex, a number of other city regions, with an integrated rural development strategy. I mean, Castletown Bear has more in common with Dingle than it does have with, than it has with Cork City. We need to be urban-based in terms of the way we think, but let, we, we, we also need to have an integrated rural development strategy. Imagine, imagine regions taking responsibility for business development. Bidding for FDI, which, which uh, the IDA come in, trying to build indigenous businesses around them. Imagine a scenario where our main cities host concentrations of farm businesses, and maybe other city regions and rural areas uh, specialise in food and tourism. I'm just imagining. But you might think this is esoteric and very academic. It's not, actually. This is uh, ultimately... Uh, this, th this is not unconnected with the EU's new spark specialisation policy. Uh, there's there's 48, 47 billion pounds per annum, euros per annum, available for this. But Ireland has failed to rise to this challenge. Lots of other European countries are rising to it. We, our submission under smart specialisation was a top-down submission. It was, it was to identify 14 res uh, priority research areas. So it's back to research. 80% of research is done for multinationals. That's the one side of the economy. What about the other side? And then at ground level, just to see, what's, this is in my own experience, I've done some work with West Cork Development Partnership, which has recently been closed. This is one of the, the leader companies, a very good company, um, but it resisted the political intervention uh, by, ultimately by, by rent seekers, by local rent seekers. They've been shut down, uh, and that's, uh, that's the, 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 uh, to me, very, very regrettable. Um, so I would ask what has changed? Uh, have we learned from the previous crisis? Uh, and unfortunately, I think we're sleepwalking into the next one. Thank you very much. Is that on time? A little over, yeah. Thank you very much, Owen. And now our uh, final respondent is Dr. Uh, Connor Skeen, who's lecturer at uh, DIT's School of Spatial Planning and Transport Engineering. He's also chairperson of the Housing Agency. And Connor will talk about the challenges of urbanization. Connor. Yes, Hey folks, um, first of all, just thanks and congratulations to NUIG. This is fantastic, all the work that's gone on. I have to say it on behalf of everybody and of course the organizing committee, privileged and very grateful to be here, so thank you. Um, I just want to begin by saying that this is a form of doing exactly what it says in the tin of challenging Kevin and saying um, that there were major issues that you have not addressed and there's just one of them that I wanted to look at, which is this, <clears throat> that everything, despite all the efforts of the committee and of NUIG, this analysis that we're doing after a mere century uh, is premature, that the work hasn't even begun. And the reason it's premature is because it's a small blip of activity that's taking place on the back of a longer arc of history, which we need to discuss more. The proposition that that statement is made on is this, that demography is destiny, and I don't mean just the numbers of people, but also where those people are. And that, as the Taoiseach so eloquently said last night, context creates culture. And culture is the thing that we must most be conscious of going out into this unsteady and uncertain world, to know ourselves and cherish ourselves and value ourselves and each other, as Mary has said. Heimat. Heimat. That is extraordinary German word that captures the idea of home and place and identity, or as they'd say in Donegal, the home place, the home place. But do we have a sure knowledge of our Heimat, the map on the left of population density of Ireland in 1841? People forget our 8.1 million pre-famine people lived in, a most, in the most dispersed pattern of rural activity that Europe knew. We uniquely in Europe do not have village-based agriculture 
and countries without village-based agriculture, when they begin the transition away from a rural population into an urban one, experience one of the greatest possible type of wrenches that a society can endure. Have we commented enough? Have we reflected enough on what that is? And do we truly know what our high mat is now? At the foundation of the state in 1921, two thirds of our population lived in rural areas. Now it's the exact opposite. A third live in urban areas, and indeed 57% live in Leinster alone. We have changed utterly, as the poet said. And we, we forget, at that time of transition, Europe had already made those transitions two generations previously as industrialization swept through Europe in the mid-19th century. Kevin, we were a completely different country to the rest of Europe in 1921, and we continue that pattern of learning and changing to become an urban people, and don't give ourselves enough credit for the difficulty of making those wrench and changes and the extraordinary youngness of this country. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy was still describing the United States after 200 years as being young, a young country. We're a young country. We've only begun to be what our potential is. There's our amazing crossover. Only in 1966, only in 1966, did our urban population begin to exceed our rural population. It's that recent. It has been reflected, this Landflucht, as it's called elsewhere in Germany, in, in Europe. This has begun to be reflected in politics. This is a, a graph of general election results uh, since the foundation of the state, white on top being Fianna Fáil, purple being Fianna Gael, and yellow being the others. And we can see that since 1977, I beg your pardon, since 1977, both the major political parties' share of the overall general election results have been in continuous and parallel decline. Our politics have begun to change to reflect our new urban realities. So I'm asking you, I'm asking Kevin, for all of us to think about the fact that the changes have only begun. We've only begun to become a truly urban society. We don't even begin to know the outlines of that map. People like myself deal with it in things like housing. People like yourself deal with it in things like children's hospitals and the appalling purgatory of trying to build things. And only then do we become aware of the extraordinary immaturity of our systems of politics, administration, governance, and perhaps even the incompetence of some of those elements in this immature state. So I'm just leaving you with that question. The graph on the left there is work we've done in DIT of the likely distribution of the population of Ireland uh, by 2030. Already 50, over 50%, 50, nearly, nearly two thirds of the people live uh, in the greater Dublin area and in Leinster. And uh, by 2030, that process is going to be completed. An urbanized society with all of the major elements changing rapidly the change has only begun, we can only begin to understand ourselves at this stage and can only look forward in amazement as to what we might be when we've truly urbanised. Thank you, Chair. So, thank you very much, Connor, and uh, uh, also for, for sticking to the time. I'm going to now look at Nicholas, uh, given that we're already over time. Um, could we have 10 minutes still? Okay, excellent. Uh, so, I'm first of all going to give Kevin the opportunity to, to respond. Yeah. Well, just, just, just very quickly then, Tony asked a question about were there other low productivity regions that had tight labour market connections with high wage regions such as we did and, well, I can think of the DDR after German reunification in a way or one could think of the Mezzogiorno in Italy, and maybe that's actually one counterfactual uh, that one could speculate about. Maybe we might have ended up you know, draining, uh, seeing our population drain away even more than actually turned out uh, to be the case. I have a question uh, for you, Mary. Uh, I, was, I loved your thing about, uh, well, I loved the whole thing, actually. Um, but I was wondering about the success of the 1916 commemorations, and they were incredibly successful. And I was thinking about the crisis, and I was wondering whether the fact that you know, those, those of us who lived through the crisis shared something, actually, that nobody else can understand, really. I mean, it was a genuinely communal event. And is there any kind of subtle or not so subtle sociological process by which that might actually have contributed to the kind of togetherness that we felt uh, over the past year, maybe? That's just a question for you. Now, you talked about dystopia, and of course, Trump, that's pretty dystopian. But on the other hand, Bernie Sanders is an honorable and a decent man, and he's addressing many of the same issues. So it doesn't have to be dystopian. 
Um, most of my career has been spent looking at the economics and the politics of globalization and of deglobalization, and there's nothing new here in this backlash against globalization, because there's always losers as well as winners, and if they lose enough and if people uh, ignore them for long enough, then, then they are going to start uh, protesting, and I think that does pose certain challenges for us, because you know we have done so well out of this hyper-globalized world, and as I say, we don't want to um, find ourselves on the, on the wrong side of history. I think it's not going to go away. I think, it's, I think, I think we have an urgent uh, interest in the European Union and the industrialized countries as a whole, uh, softening the edges of globalization, uh, making sure that the state doesn't lose too much, uh, that the market doesn't gain too much, that losers are left sink without trace. We need those supports. Uh, and, you know, Ireland has always tended to argue for sort of liberal policies and all that stuff, and that's been in our self-interest. But I think enlightened self-interest now needs to understand that other countries are not winning from all of this the way that we have done, and that if we are too rigid, uh, then things end up going very badly wrong. I like the move about, I mean, the domestic rent-seeking argument that Owen was making has been made often before. I like the move to link that to our rent-seeking activities on the international level with respect to taxation. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that is, that is uh, an issue, you know. And on the one side, we have Trump, who wants to play the same game as us, and he has every right to. And on the other side, we have decent social democracies who want to maintain their revenue bases and don't want to see the burden of taxation shifted uniquely onto labor because mobile capital is getting away with murder. So you know, I think we do have to uh, refocus in the years ahead, which is, of course, where we get into uh, the stuff about education and human capital formation and everything else. If, if we're not ultimately going to be able to play the tax composition game, we have to make sure that we're as competitive as possible on every other front. And of course, the inequalities that you were talking about, Alan, they're not just morally wrong, they represent an enormous waste of, uh, of resources. Uh, so I think that's what all I want to say, really. And I'm interested to hear what people on the floor have to say. Thank you very much, Kevin. So uh, what I think I'll do is take a, a few questions together. Uh, so um, if you could uh, state your, uh, your, your name, uh, be as brief as you can with the questions so we can get as many in uh, as possible, uh, and then we'll put the questions uh, to the panel. I think the first hand I saw is just over there. Yeah. Uh, Tom. Hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tommy Aradi is my name. I just have a question. Um, basically, is Brexit a certainty at this stage uh, once Article 50 is invoked, or is there any possibility at the end of the negotiations that the British government could put whatever deal to the people again and that they could choose, uh, if you like, a second referendum on Brexit? Thank you. Next time, as always, here. My name is... Uh my name is Brendan O'Leary. The question is to Kevin O'Rourke. Um, I find your analysis fascinating. I'd like to know your judgment on the implications for the Northern Irish economy of a hard departure of the UK from the EU. Okay, thank you. And just here in the third row. Hello. Uh, Frank Connolly is my name. Uh, back in 1972, when we were negotiating to enter the then EEC, uh, Paddy Hillary was the main negotiator and Jim Gibbons was the Minister for Agriculture. I wrote a letter to the then Secretary of the Department of Agriculture and stating broadly that Ireland had three great natural assets. One was agriculture, two was tourism, and three was our uh, territorial, the fishing rights in our territorial waters. Now, in every discussion that I've heard, and I've been at dozens of them, I never heard anybody address the loss, the great loss uh, of our fishing rights uh, in, in, to the EEC as it was then. And because I remember back in the middle 60s going out to Clifton and with binoculars you could see Russian factory ships being fed by trawlers, fishing in what was actually Irish ter territorial uh, waters. So I can't understand why one of our greatest assets is being ignored 
by economists and by government. Thank you very much. Maybe we could just take one more in this round. There's another question. See the hand there at the back, the last row. Hi, Claire Brown is my name. I'm just curious that we're still here talking the same things that we've always talked about over the years about the growth of the economy and the co this sort of constant movement of markets. And I guess I'm struck by the, the reality of what's going on in the world and the way we're using resources and the, the depletion, which is marked by that last um, gentleman there that posed the question about the fishing industry. You can talk about anything around the world, it's the same. We're taking stuff at, a, at such a, a, a fast rate that exponentially we are driving an economy that cannot c continue the way it is. But we're talking as if it does, as if it's going to continue, as if we're going to keep at this. But I think we all know here in the room that it cannot keep going in the same way. So I'm wondering, maybe, Kevin, if you have any new information for us on economy, how could we change it so that we can actually address this in a realistic fashion, because we're not addressing it at all. We're, it's the elephant in the room that we keep ignoring. Um, and just to add to that last gentleman with the, the fishing and the massive exploitation that's gone off around our own coastline, the same thing is happening, for example, with seaweed at the moment. Just here off the west coast, we sold off uh, a huge tract of fishing or seaweed rights to a, um, a Canadian company. It goes back to, I can't remember, maybe it was, um, was it Connor or was it Tony? I don't know, sorry. Somebody mentioned about keeping things at a more local level. You know, can we not bring up our own industries? Can we not have our own people do things on maybe a different scale? Thank you. Great. Um, I think we'll just take uh, one more question. I just saw one more hand in this round, and then uh, we'll turn to the panel. Uh, right off. Yeah. My name is Srinivas Raghavendra. I'm a lecturer in economics here in the department. Um, listening to the discussions and uh, keynote address, uh, one of the fundamental inconsistency that we have in the contemporary uh, capitalism is that you have, you know, political democracy of one adult, one oath sits not quite well with the market democracy of few people having unequal economic and political power. The fact that we're not able to capture, we meaning the in the economic framework that uses the analysis using the the mainstream established, sorry, established uh, economic framework, establishment economic framework, is that we have simply disconnected society from economics. And this is fundamentally important for us to rehumanize econo economics. And the promise of the future, the, for the, of the next 100 years, is actually going back 200 years and resurrect the economics tradition that we used to have in terms of engaging both society and economy in a, in a broader framework of political economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, a really excellent set of questions. So we had a uh, question on Brexit and whether they could, we could, whether they might vote again. Uh, there is the, uh, the implications also uh, for the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, we had a uh, question on possibly the negative effects uh, of uh, joining the uh, EEC and uh, in particular the implications uh, for fishing. Um, question about the possible overemphasis uh, on economic growth and the implications for uh, resource uh, depletion. And uh, the final question there in terms of whether economics has uh, gone on the wrong path and um, uh, needs to bring back uh, a focus on both economy and society in a sort of broader political economy. Uh, so, uh, lots of great questions. Not all panelists have to pick up on everything there, so maybe we'll start off with you, uh, Kevin. Uh, two questions were uh, uh, put particularly uh, to you, the implications for the Northern Ireland economy uh, and also the uh, potential overemphasis uh, on growth, uh, uh, 
which yeah. is something a lot of economists probably do. Uh, but let, I'll let you start. Okay. So first of all, can Brexit be revoked? We have some very distinguished lawyers in the room. It's kind of a legal question. I gather that they're divided on the question, but my sense is that they will go ahead and leave, and we just have to hope that it's as soft a Brexit as possible. Um, I think that the implications for the North are grim, actually. 40% plus of their exports go to the Republic. That's exports you know, to outside the UK. Only about 1.5% of our exports go to them. So they're much more heavily exposed to this than we are now. You might say the logical solution, and I'm sure it's the one that we would want, is for then any eventual tariff border to between Ireland and Britain. I'd certainly like that, but I guess that doesn't help the North that much, because I'm guessing that an awful lot of their exports go to mainland Britain as well. So I think either way, they're really stuck. And the problem is that insofar as they're producing stuff, it's largely food and agriculture, and that's going to be very heavily tariffed. So what in God's name the DUP was doing? Uh, taking the position they did, I don't know. Um, fish and the climate, they're both the same question, really. They're about common resource problems. You know, markets are good at lots of things, but they're not good at um, conserving resources that uh, can be used by people just, just willy-nilly. So, so you know, f fishing is, is one of the only sectors of the economy where it still proceeds as if we were all hunter-gatherers. You know, you just go out and you fish, you know? And that's not sustainable, ultimately. Similarly, the climate, you know, we can all individually uh, contribute to climate warming and ultimately be bad for all of us. So these are two great canonical examples where you need international agreements, you know, or else the thing won't work at all. And the worry, of course, with Trump is that he's going to tear up the, the various commitments that the US has made to climate change. And then we're going to really be stuck. And I think we're going to have to face head on the possibility of climate-related tariffs, because in the real world, there's no way that individual countries are going to agree to hobble their own industries and impose costs if other countries aren't playing the game, and then we find ourselves being swamped with cheap, uh, you know, polluting type of uh, goods from elsewhere. To make the thing work, you have to put on tariffs. I think that, that, that may end up happening. I really hope that we don't have to do that vis-a-vis -vis the states, though. Uh, we'll just have to see. And, yeah, on the... Uh, economy and economics and so on. I think the answer is people should do economic history because if you do economic <laughs> history, uh, then you find that you uh, can't ignore the political and you can't ignore the social if you're actually understanding how uh, real economies and countries and societies evolved through time. So I think it should be part of the mainstream economics curriculum everywhere. Thanks, Kevin. Alan, one or more of those questions? I'll sort of pick and choose, but um, on the issue of, of Northern Ireland, Kevin uh, touched on this already. Northern Ireland does stand to lose enormously uh, from, from Brexit. That's very, very clear. And the position of the DUP before the referendum was unfortunate uh, in the sense that they were looking forward to a Brexit. But to be honest, the situation is now being compounded uh, because now you have the major political party in Northern Ireland that remains essentially in denial. Uh, so rather than admitting that there is a major, major problem, they are continuing with the line that they previously had, which is, this is no big deal, and in many ways this could be good. So I think there is huge concern in uh, sort of uh, political circles in the, in the South that if the DUP were really to engage with the, the problem as it is, uh, it might be possible uh, to start really engaging and to be talking in terms of special status for Northern Ireland. But if the people you're talking to do not want that special status and are really in denial, uh, well, this is a terribly, terribly worrying situation. And then to link it, of course, to some of the economic, political, and social considerations, I don't think there's anybody in this room who understands uh, that the sort of the, the worry that goes with a Northern Ireland, which sort of slips back economically, uh, mixed with the possibility of the border re-emerging, there's essentially a cocktail uh, of issues there that are really, really quite uh, distressing and disturbing, I'd have to say. Yeah, well, I, I just uh, really appreciated the last point uh, which was made about the sort of uh, disjuncture between economics, say, and sociology. I think they should have an elective affinity, as Max Weber would have said, but in fact, they've gone in very different directions. And I think there's real limits to a rational actor model of society that doesn't take into account of you know, where people are positioned in terms of social structure and their cultural location. And in a, in a strange kind of way, the panel, which is largely dominated by economists, uh, I think it actually worked that we were able to bring out some of the threads that, that connect each other so that you know, it, it isn't enough to 
envision or encapsulate or even plot the course of history by simply looking at economics, that you always have to look at the political economy and look at the, you know, the social context of things. And, and in some ways, we've managed to accomplish that, I think, in the panel today, which is kind of nice, yeah. <laughs> unusual. Tony? It's very quick. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to make up for <laughs> taking too much time. Sorry. Um, on the fisheries thing, I agree with you totally in terms of it as a resource, but that's the essence of globalization. There's give and take. We're not going to go to the EU and say we want to join, we want access to your market, we want your common agricultural policy and your subsidies, but you're not getting our fish. Now, maybe you might argue we didn't negotiate very well, we should have negotiated better, but on balance, quite apart from the political thing, which I'll come to in a moment, on balance, the EU has been good for the Irish economy, even allowing for the fact that we lost the fish. Now, it's not been particularly good for the fishing sector because they're the ones who are losing. <clears throat> but that's the essence of it. Like in America, the problem is financial services is booming, the entertainment industry is booming, exporting films all over the world, but their steel industry collapses. There are winners and there are losers. And the problem in the way we've approached globalization is we probably haven't given enough attention to the distribution consequences. We just focused on the GDP figure and the improvement. But economic theory, which I will defend to the death, um, emphasizes there are distributional consequences to globalization. It's a problem with politics if they don't adequately deal with those distribution issues and they let them reach boiling point, as it were. But any basic international trade theory will tell you there are problems with globalization because there are gainers and there are losers. And the issue is to try and balance the two of them. Um, as regards the, the point about economics and people, it's very interesting that we've talked about Brexit and Trump and so on, and all we focused on is economics. Well, I personally would vote to leave the EU tomorrow. Um, I would not in any sense doubt that it would have major negative economic consequences. If I was British, I would vote for Brexit while acknowledging there will be major negative economic consequences because there is, to echo your point, there's more to life than economics. There's political sovereignty. There's independence. We left one union with the United Kingdom to join another union and we're going with our eyes closed towards an even closer political union. Now, I personally do not want to be governed by Brussels. I don't want to be governed by the European Parliament. I want to be governed by a Dublin sovereign government, or even a Cork sovereign government, as it <laughs> comes to the case. Um, so there are other motivations besides economics. So it's not just you can't do this because it's bad for the economy. That's just one of the consequences. And if you're willing to pay the price, good enough. Now, if you're being misled or you're an idiot or people are telling you lies, that's inappropriate. So I would say categorically, Brexit is a disaster for the British economy, but if I was British, I still would have voted to leave. Thanks, Tony. Owen? Um, yeah, um, I'm just going to pick up on two points. One, one about the fishing argument. I think the, the, the explanation there is down to the, the weakness of the fishing lobby relative to the farming lobby. And basically, I think they were sold out. Uh, the power of the IFA won out. Um, in terms of, uh, someone mentioned who talked about local. Well, that was, that was me and, and probably Connor as well. Um, and I think that's really important. I think it does, it does link over to what Mary was saying to kind of harness the, the, the type of stuff that Mary, Mary was talking about. Um, but it's a double-edged sword because what I said, and I believe that there should be control and responsibility. So people have to learn from mistakes. So they have, you know, they've elected authorities with tax-raising powers. You know, you, you, you can't be just spending and hoping someone else would bail you out. I think that's what we need to get into our system. Um, but there's a big danger with that. Part of the reason we centralised was because um, the national politicians felt, well, if we leave it to the locals, the rent-seeking will just go rampant. And that's the problem, as I see it. Thanks, Owen. Connor, final word. Where do you begin? Um, a thread running through uh, quite a lot of the comments here is what has us with Trump going into the White House. The removal of evidence from public discourse. Paying the price. Do you know what the price would be of getting rid of modern agriculture and modern urbanization? 
In the 1840s, half of your household income would go on food. Most of your children would die before they were 21. Do you really want to go back to that? Do you really know what we're doing with the actual environment and the actual resources we have in this actual world? In this world where we think we're running out like Malthus did of space and land and food? The biggest economies in the world are taking land out of agricultural production because we have too much food in the world. This is a fact. And yet the public debate among educated people in an institution of learning still persists in allowing us that type of sloppy thinking where we ignore the hard facts of what we've achieved in the last 150 years in the whole world. And the things we talk about localization overlook the fact that urbanization is not just a challenge for Ireland, it's an issue everywhere in the world. I do work for the United Nations all over the world and I stand in the villages of Nepal and I stand in the villages of Myanmar or in Afghanistan and we forget that in addition to being those types of places they are also urbanizing society. Every kid in Afghanistan wants to get as far as Kabul. None of them want to continue to be tied to the appalling umbilicum of a society based on subsistence agriculture. We can't close the door on the material gains that began since the Renaissance and we moved to a cash-based society. Subsistence societies are about disease and suffering and insecurity. We've made a choice and it was a wise choice. Okay, uh, thank you, Conor. I feel like the discussion is probably uh, just beginning, but thanks to Nicholas's indulgence, we had an extra 30 minutes, but I think we do have to stop there. So I'd just finally like to thank our plenary uh, speaker, uh, and our um, uh, five respondents for, for what I think was really a, an excellent session and uh, covered an awful lot of ground, and I think we have uh, an awful lot to think about. Uh, so thank you to you all.